Helldivers 2 is really about smashing bugs and bots, but if you take the time to talk to some of the NPCs in your Super Destroyer, you might just learn that the universe of Helldivers is a lot more screwed up than any of us suspected, and sadly, quite a bit like our own. I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. Uh, let's get right into it. So, by the way, guys, real quick, please hit the subscribe button. I'm so close to 100,000 subscribers, and I would love it if the Helldivers community was what took me over the threshold to 100K. First up is, of course, your service technician. And what's fascinating and I kind of appreciate is that in the Helldivers lore, they acknowledge that the individual Helldiver is actually not the thing that projects power. Uh, the actual weapon that's doing most of the work is your super destroyer and its accompanying technology. And this is a lot like the United States. We like to, to I'm going to use the word worship. Civilians have a weird worship of Green Berets and Navy SEALs. But the messy reality is that those guys are only as good as the tech that supports them, right? A SEAL team without radios, without drones overhead, without uh, detailed map reconnaissance of their target, uh, without air support, uh, QRF, uh, stealth helicopters, and of course, uh, tens of thousands of dollars of night vision and laser aiming modules. Uh, really, they're not that good. And I know this because we trained Iraqi and Afghan special forces to a to the same standard, right? The best Afghan units were as as good as the best um, U.S. units in a lot of cases, or at least within you know a, a couple percentage points. But what they didn't have was boring old logistics people behind them. And so when the when the chips were down, right, when the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, uh, it turned out the Afghan military wasn't actually able to get bullets and aircraft and uh, ordnance and support to those uh, elite units. And the result, of course, was pretty tragic. Uh, the casualty rates among those elite of the elite units were around 100% because the price of being an elite unit means also that uh, individual forces like the Taliban considered you too dangerous to be allowed to live. Um, same thing happened with like elite Iraqi police units when ISIS took over. Um, the ineffectual Iraqi government just didn't make a, it wasn't willing to or able to organize itself in a way to effectively support those units. So again, we sit there sometimes and we, uh, you know, worship these these small number of elite troops believing that even without all their gear, they'd be capable of great things. And, and while it's a hard job and selection is very difficult, um, at the end of the day, a SEAL without a well-maintained weapon, without aircraft, without aircraft that work is nothing. So again, who's more important here, the Helldiver or the service tech? The answer is both of them. And depending on the level of specialization, uh, based on the fact that a Helldiver is pretty expendable, this service tech knows the ins and outs of every one of these stratagems, well, the service tech may actually be the more valuable uh, soldier in, on the screen right now. Ever run into any equipment issues, let me know. I've got your back. When I was a kid, I always loved All Heroes Eve. The adults would all dress up as bugs and ring our doorbells, and we'd have to fire three shots in the air and say, no fascism here, insects. At the end of the night, they'd reenact the Battle of Liberty Peak, and we'd all get cake. You know, these actually aren't exactly the same bugs we fought in the Great Galactic War. <laughs> yeah, 100 years of rapid evolution, not to mention all the genetic modification they got on the E-710 farms. Interesting. So you notice there that they alluded to something that actually shows up in some of the propaganda broadcasts, which is the uh, reality that the bugs are actually a product of the government, right? That the government performed a bunch of genetic experiments creating this uh, infestation of rapidly evolving bugs. And what's kind of interesting is that uh, it's not unlike another global event that you might remember, that for a long time, the government's official stance was that it was just kind of a naturally occurring threat. I can't say what it is because this is YouTube, um, but that naturally occurring threat now actually, the government's official position uh, is that 
uh, a natural origin and a man-made that it was an existing entity that was genetically altered uh, and then got out are considered equally valid theories. Um, and again, this isn't me. I'm not here to like tell you, you know, I'm not some crazy truther. I'm just putting out what the intelligence community in the United States has officially said. And so it's a reminder that sometimes in this case, the, the truth can sometimes be in front of us, but it's the job of propaganda to turn the volume down on the uncomfortable truths and to turn the volume up on the scenarios that they like. Even sometimes we don't have total truth, right? We don't know for certain. Nobody knows. Or at least the people that do know for certain have been either silenced or have said nothing. So all we can go off of is the evidence. And you can collect evidence about the world around you. And then you weigh the evidence as best you can. And you make your best guess, right? That's all we can do. My best guess is that tomorrow the sun's going to come up, right? It might not. Sun might explode. It's possible. It happens to stars all the time. But the preponderance of the evidence is that the sun's going to rise tomorrow. And so that's why I'm going to make plans for my day tomorrow, right? So the point is, is that in this world, the acknowledgement that the truth is out there, but it's hidden behind propaganda or a little aside, right? It's treated as like a fun, goofy fact, uh, when in fact, it's a pretty stark revelation that these bugs are actually of the government's making. Oh, I can't wait to get home again. It's the little things you miss, you know? Like sitting in candlelight on Heroes Day, chanting with my family and renewing our vows of citizenship together. Uh, I just set all the ship's clocks back an hour for freedom savings time. I'm gonna spend my extra hour doing another round of maintenance checks. It's nice, because today I won't have to work overtime to get them done. Back when I was a kid. So interesting, right? Uh, gotta love the uh, nonsense of daylight savings time on a ship, which doesn't make any sense, right? Um, you're in space. You can jump from planet to planet, day to night. Um, and what's fascinating is that it's just, to me, illustrative of the fact that the government sometimes sets policies. And when I worked in Homeland Security, um, you could tell when Congress had mandated something because it would oftentimes involve a tremendous amount of bureaucratic labor and be totally redundant. Uh, for example, they we were required in my office to uh, produce an end of year report that uh, showed um, everything that we had done over the course of the year, um, all of the costs questioned and and uh, money clawed back, et cetera. Um, and we were required to actually do this, uh, I think it was annually. The problem is that everything that was contained in that report had already been given to Congress. Like by our agency's mandate, we reported everything we did to Congress. So we basically gave them information we all that they already had, and it was it's hard to overstate. There were that we had an entire office, like five or six people whose only career in the U.S. government, funded by you, the taxpayer, was to produce a report containing information that every member of Congress already had access to. Um, and by the way, I could tell you, most members of Congress didn't read any of those reports. Not a one of them, not the year-end summary, not the individual reports, nothing. So it's it, 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 these things often happen, or here's an even worse example, right? You know the border crisis, right? The migrant crisis that every year, every it happens every maybe three years, right? There's sort of a natural migration cycle. It's actually very predictable. Um, Border Patrol has algorithms that, that predict migration patterns to a pretty good degree of fidelity. And every year... Um, the highest levels of the Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon, they get together, they come up with a migration mitigation plan, and it is a playbook. It is a series of steps that get ungated automatically that are carefully arranged so that as migration patterns rise, the ability of the government to respond to it rises in turn so that they go lockstep and suddenly they can divert resources and, and, and mobilize um, you know, the whole of government to respond to a crisis. The problem is that every year it is produced, no one ever looks at it. Nobody ever pulls it off the shelf. Every year we would ask, 
where's your migration migration crisis plan? We would talk to the people who were supposed to be in charge, become in charge of these migration crises. And uh, every year they would say, I'm supposed to be in charge of what? I'm who? I'm in charge? They're like, yeah, you're, you're the joint, you're the Southwest border joint like coordination office. It says here in this plan that was signed off on by the secretary of Homeland security that when migrations cross 10,000 persons a day, um, your office becomes the coordination cell pulling together all resources across all the government to, 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 to solve the migration crisis. And they'd be like, never heard of it. And so that's the thing, right? It's just like, like freedom savings time. Right. You come up with this thing. You say, oh, we're going to make freedom savings time. It's going to save a little bit of energy on uh, on planet Earth. It's going to stop people from having to run their lights. Uh, but then nobody, nobody actually pulls the book off the shelf and asks, what is this really for? Why do we do this? What is the purpose of this? And unless you do that, you're just going to be instinctively doing things, right? Like you're just going to instinctively change the clocks kid we used to play bug killers out in the schoolyard whoever could kill the most bugs by the end of recess won sometimes the teachers would join in too i'm hoping to raise my citizenship level by the time i retire if i ever have kids i'd want them to be able to purchase a small pet someday like a goldfish or even a hamster if i had all the super credits in the galaxy i'd try to find some way to convince our enemies to embrace freedom maybe print a trillion pamphlets or or build a billion interplanetary radio stations something to break through whatever propaganda they're feeding them <sighs> it's just a pipe dream you gotta kill them all this is what i find sort of fascinating is the average voter in the united states right oftentimes has these really low sophistication ideas and they are fed those low sophistication ideas. This is a nice way of saying stupid ideas, stupid concepts, right? And think about like the idea that we were going to come in and we were going to get a Afghan society, right? And that's the example I'm most likely drawn. A society that has functioned in the same way, by the same set of rules, as far as I could tell for about five to 7,000 years. The belief of the United States and those idiots in the Pentagon were that we could go in without speaking the language as a totally separate, different culture with no cultural like credibility, and we could get them to change the way their genders related to each other, change the way marriage worked, change the way uh, decisions were made in their society, uh, change the economic structure of their society, pivoting it from growing uh, opium, something they've grown for, again, around a thousand years, uh, to growing some other cash crop that was less profitable and not going to be able to be grown there. Um, and that we are going to make all of these changes uh, in the span of 20 years, right? And like people really thought that. They really thought that if we just told them how great freedom was, whatever the, whatever the fuck that means to an Afghan, that that they would just, they'd get it. They'd be like, oh, of course, of course I shouldn't grow poppy. Of course I shouldn't uh, have 13-year-old girls marry. Of course I shouldn't. Like, like, trust me, I'm not saying these ideas are like good, but the point is, is that it's not for me to decide, right? The best I can do is be like, listen, in my society, I think that's screwed up, but you've been doing things 5,000 years the exact same way. America, we can't change it. And it was sort of insane to think that we could. If I were a hell diver, I think my favorite enemy to kill would be the bugs. It's gotta be real satisfying hearing them crunch under your boot. Whenever the war gets me down, I try to remember that at least I'm a free citizen. It's up to me how I serve Super Earth. Right. This is what I find kind of fascinating, is that it's up to me how I, their definition of freedom seems to be, it's up to me how I serve Super Earth. And this is the thing, right? There's a lot of like notions of freedom, but you know, as a lot of people love to point out, it's that if you're broke in America, like how free are you really? Like what choice do you have? You got to work, you got to pay rent, you got to pay for health insurance, you got to have food, right? Like just at a minimum, you need probably, I'd say around... Thirty-five to forty thousand dollars, depending on where you live. You got to bring that in a year to to just survive, to just survive and and have the ability to receive like basic medical care, 
food and shelter and the ability to get to and from work. Because remember, you're free to go anywhere you want. As long as you have gas, current registration, you have uh, your current on your car payments, um, you have a license that hasn't been suspended or revoked or expired. Um, so, you know, you're totally free. And this is, again, a, a classic like government move of just like using the bureaucracy. You, the government uses these tools to like not force behavior. They can't force you to do stuff like North Korea, but they can incentivize certain behaviors. And when you do things like say, listen, we have no public transit. Your only way to get to and from work is with a car. And that car is highly regulated. So you have to do certain things in order to be able to get to and from work to have shelter. And so they understand that they use this bureaucratic space to be like, okay, you may not want to give the government your photo ID, but if you want to get to work, you got to have a driver's license. And to have a driver's license, government has to have a current photo of you and your name and your date of birth and your social, right? Can't take that for granted. So like they say, oh, you're free to do whatever you want, but you're not. Just like she's free to serve Super Earth in any way she chooses. But as she discusses, if she wants to have kids, then she's got to serve in whatever capacity she can. In this case, it's being a service tech on a Super Destroyer. Before I joined the service, I'd never left my home planet. Now I see a new planet almost every day. It makes me appreciate what a beautiful democracy it'll be once we finish stamping out those fascist bugs. I still remember filling out my very first Democratic preferences ballot. Whew, what a rush. I earned a few more citizenship points the other day. Yeah, okay, managed democracy is one of my favorites. Uh, this is just my favorite meme in this whole thing. Uh, because it's not brilliant because it's obviously not real democracy. And it's not even really representative. Uh, my favorite part is the fact that... Uh, Again, in my country, the old US of A, and this is me dunking on the USA. I actually, I, I love my country. And I think that it, uh, the haters over-exaggerate how like, boo, America bad. The America bad crew is is dumber than the America can do no wrong crew. Like they're, they're, they're actually dumber. Um, but as someone who served the, my country, put my life on the line for them, I think I've reserved the right to criticize them. You know, it's like your parents, right? Like, or your, your siblings. You love them more than anyone on this earth, but it gives you the right to, to also roast them harder than anyone on this earth. And so I just want to roast the democratic preferences and the managed democracy because I want you guys, I've pointed this out. If you wanted to end the war in Afghanistan, if you were a voter and you were like, I hate those damn soldiers in Afghanistan, F them, I, I want the war over today. Who would you have voted for? What was the candidate in the 2008 election that would have brought the troops home? Bush? McCain? Obama? Who was the anti-war candidate? There was no major party that advocated for the end of the war. You had a small window of choice, and you knew that no matter who you voted for, right, things weren't really going to change, right? In fact, they basically, the same trend that we've seen in this country from the get-go has remained intact, right? One of my favorite is when people talk about, wow, I can't believe, uh, you know, I, then they go, man, I don't understand why people don't trust uh, their government anymore and why they th they want to see like outsiders take over outsiders are so dangerous to the country and to stability okay i want to show you this this is called the gini index gini index is a measure of how unequal a society is how high th how far apart the lowest of the low and the highest of the high are right and as you can see going back to the 60s and 70s in 1980 this was a country that was pretty equal, pretty egalitarian. Gini index of 34. Now, now look at what's happened over the last 45 years. The Gini index has basically never gone down. The country has become more and more and more unequal. And here's the other thing. You know what you don't see? You see a little bit of ups and downs, but they don't really track to election years. No matter who's in party, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Oh, look at this. Look at this. For a brief, beautiful moment, 
people sort of got a little more equal there. All it took was a a world ending, you know, a a international uh, global economic crisis plunged the Gini index down to the 40, by the way, which rolled the clock back to 1999. And then it climbed back up. And now, right, you can see 2019, just prior to COVID, we had an all-time high in this country, an all-time high inequality. So it doesn't matter who's in charge, right? Core policies, the core outlook for the country was never changing. People just every five or six years, the, the the average person did a little bit worse and the rich people did a little bit better and better and better. And then in COVID, luckily, basically, this is solely because of the COVID crash. Well, the COVID market crash and the government sent people like 1500 bucks. And because the government sent people 1500 bucks, it plummeted the Gini index. And I'd be really curious to see the last three years of data. Um, right? And notice here, U.S. recessions. U.S. recessions, just sometimes they don't even hit rich people. Like, look here, the rich still got richer in the 80s during the recession. Every other time, the recession, because recession is when stock markets go down and rich people own mostly stocks, and this country always, always favors rich people who own stuff, um, you know, they, they, they tend to bounce back. So all this to say, guys, uh, this whole, the whole point of this entire conversation is just that you think you're voting for like different candidates, but if voting for both parties, and there's a hundred trends you can look at that behave this way, that regardless of the person in charge, the trend line continues. And it's to me, the best evidence that there's not really a substantive policy difference, no matter who is in charge. That's it, right? That's, that's the thesis. All it took was reporting some unpatriotic talk I heard in the barracks. Now there's one less dissident, and I get one more doctor's visit every year. I remember when I was a kid, they sold stickers in the Freedom Catalog that were these little squish bugs. You put them on the bottom of your boot, and it, it was like you were squashing bugs every time you took a step. Everyone was collecting them, trying to get the rare ones. Man, those things were cool. Helldiver. Okay, this is one of my favorites, actually, because do you remember growing up when I was a kid, selling kids collectible things was like the business and man it was like an all-out blitz when a new thing became a fad um remember tamagotchis tamagotchis were these little japanese like pet keychains that were battery powered and you had to like press a button every so often to feed them or else they would starve but if you press the button regularly um they would grow bigger and bigger and uh of course in retrospect they're dumb they're not real they're a game where you just have to every four to every 12 to 4 to 12 hours just press a button so kind of dumb but it became like an all-consuming fad it was in media and every kid had them and it was kind of weird i don't know how else to put it i let's let's you know what we're, we're doing conspiracy theories join me on another one i have a conspiracy theory that there is a coordinated effort among major corporations to push certain fads obsessively and they kind of have been getting better and better at it over time but it becomes kind of an all-out blitz and they started with kids in the 90s i think maybe in the 80s where they would just say okay this year it's pogs collectible pogs and because you can't just sell kids one toy that's not that profitable but if you sell kids a whole line of toys a whole series of toys right then you can really make some money so what you do is you push it on television you push it on at the time magazines you push it in toy stores you push this stuff out like hard and what you do then is you get kids to make these constant purchases you get their parents really to make these huge collection purchases because again kids having collections it's like a referendum for how much you care for your kids right like if you love your kids more they have more stuff than the other kids it's a little psychological hack and i'm sure parents also in that era got inundated with messages that buying the best for your kids was the same thing as loving your kids um and i have a theory that the 90s was like the version one of that and that by the 2010s, it became not about like love for your kids as like the, the driving force that pushed consumption, 
but it became um, ideology. They realized that if you care about this thing or that thing, if you believe this or that, then you make these purchasing choices, right? The most uh, obvious one is the U.S. and firearms, right? The NRA used to be about hunting, used to be about marksmanship programs, and it used to be about um, like like firearm safety. And But when they realized, gun manufacturers realized that if they turned their weapons into symbols, like backed by an ideology, reflections of an ideological belief, especially a belief like freedom and, and the the right of an American to like own an AR-15 um, as a statement of like, of like asserting yourself as a free independent American, those that sold so many more guns than anything else, than, than any hunter safety course, than any discount, than anything else. And I think when you hear about an ideology linking it to a consumption decision, right? Buy this to save the climate. Buy that to stand up for freedom. Buy this, buy that. Assert. I think it's just a game, right? Like, it's just a game. I can tell you, I know lots of people who bought AR-15s who have never fired them. They did it solely because they believed that it was making some kind of statement about their stance on freedom, which is insane to me. Like you can, whether or not you own something does not, does not need to reflect your stance on it. Every day you put yourself at risk to defend freedom and liberty. And I just want to say, thank you. Long shift deployments are great for saving up. You get the family separation bonus, which more than makes up for the bunk and chow fees. Of course, I don't qualify for the bonus since I haven't been approved yet. But once I am, I'll have a nice nest egg saved up. <laughs> this is my favorite. That's exactly how the real military works, by the way, guys. The exact way the real military works. Um, so, one, pay errors, non-approval. Oh, my God. I would get approved for promotions all of the time. And it would take them months and months and months and months to, to not pay me. It drove me fucking crazy. Uh, the military actually codifies it, that where you get a promotion, but then they don't pay you in accordance with the promotion. They call it P promotable in parentheses. But they did the same thing to me in the federal government. I would qualify for promotions, and then I would have to, I would have to sometimes hand walk my documentation to be like, see, I have met the requirements. Contractually, you were supposed to promote me six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. You owe me back pay. And they go, well, you're not approved for it. And I'm like, you're the government. Listen, if you wanted to, if I, if I, like, if I punched somebody in the face, they wouldn't need eight weeks to process the form to arrest me, right? Like if they caught me driving with like my license suspended, they wouldn't need six to eight weeks to decide if I had really needed to get my, you know, go to jail, right? So like when the government wants to do something quickly, it will. But when the government wants to guard its money, nickel and dime you to death, right? They, nothing will stop them. They'll create all this nonsense. And, oh, the bunk and chow fees for a soldier on deployment. Now, we didn't get charged bunk and chow fees, but what we did get is that if you lost government equipment in a war zone, by the way, I point this out, in a war zone that the government sent you, if you lost, and some of it was like sensitive, sensitive equipment, right? Some of it was like, hey, you have this uh, radio that can hold our encryption. That's a big deal to lose. But sometimes they'd be like, you lost a GPS tracker, and I'm like, guys, I have a GPS tracker in my car at home. I'm like, this is not, and the government would charge you. They would say, you owe us $3,000 for this GPS tracker that was designed in the 90s. And it'd be like, really? You're going to charge the soldier? You're going to charge a 19-year-old private because he lost a, a GPS tracker in a war zone? Like, really? We're going to go after him for this? And the, the thing that made people so mad, one... There's a saying that became really popular for a while uh, that was a, a general who loses a war faces less consequences than a soldier who loses a rifle, right? And that's the truth, right? Uh, and the irony, let's see if we can find it here. It's actually, huh, this cites it to a 2007 article 
Um, a private who loses a rifle suffers far greater consequences from the Armed Forces Journal, but this is completely true. Um, a private who loses a rifle, here's what would happen if you lost your rifle. One, you would be told, find your rifle. Your team leader and your fire team would go looking for that rifle frantically. Your squad would then be alerted and they would, uh, right? Let me see if I can find it here, right? Here we go. So this private who loses a rifle, right? Their squad is going to go looking for it. Their platoon is going to go looking for it. Then their company commander, their platoon leader, their officer chain of command is going to be alerted. And the officer chain of command is going to start to, uh, basically, they're going to fire that private. Well, that private's going to get charged basically criminally with the crim with the version of a misdemeanor. Um, they will be charged to pay for that rifle. Uh, that platoon leader will likely lose their job. Um, they'll be likely reassigned and they'll be told in no uncertain terms that their career has, pro they should not re they should not extend their service beyond their initial term of enlistment. Um, regardless of whether or not it was actually the, the, um, the uh, platoon leader's fault. All the all the non-commissioned officers, the sergeants in their chain of command, they would likely be given what's called negative counseling statements, and maybe the team lead and squad leader would be also um, charged with a misdemeanor. Um, the yeah, likely the entire if it's if it's stateside, the entire post would lock down. No one no one would be allowed to enter or exit until the rifle was found. And by the way, guys, remember those AR-15s I told you about that they would sell for fifteen hundred dollars to literally anyone. It is 99% the same rifle as the one I'm describing causing an entire military post to lock down. If it was Afghanistan, you would probably actually send out like multiple, multiple combat patrols until that rifle was found. Um, that's the kind of, of response that a private, um, a private losing a rifle would get, right? In contrast... If you are someone who loses a war, uh, like, uh, you know, old David Petraeus here, um, as a result of uh, the failure, and I actually think he was, he he, he gave it the old college try, um, but he, you know, failed in Iraq. Iraq is a deeply unstable country. We failed in Afghanistan, as did McChrystal, um, and of course, uh, he became CIA director, right? And actually ended up, let's see, uh, I think he ended up, uh, yeah, retiring honorably. There you go. There was, uh, yeah, he apparently, oh, I didn't know this. Uh, apparently DOJ recommended felony charges for providing classified intel to, uh, his biographer who he was having an affair with, um, Petraeus denied the allegations and refused a plea deal. And then Petraeus agreed to plead guilty in federal court, but only to unauthorized removal and retention of classified information. The irony is, of course, that all, we now know that almost every high-level government official does these things, um, including both Trump and Biden as presidents. Um, and then, of course, he was allowed to retire with honors, become a professor, work at KK, uh, KKR, uh, and sit on a bunch of boards. So I say this because... Man, that's not really meaningful consequences. And the only consequence he faced had nothing to do with losing the war at all. Nothing. Just because he slept with his biographer, who was cleared to have that material, by the way. She was a lieutenant colonel. So I say this because, you know, the... Anyway, leadership gets just uh, absolutely, well... Approved yet, but once I am... I'll have a nice nest egg saved up. Screwing privates, screwing privates and, and charging like the most nickel and diming privates to death is like a, just a, just a classic military move. You know, sometimes. And if you're a general, if you're one of the elites, you face no consequences. Sometimes, as a technician, you got to realize when something's beyond repair. When it comes to these automatons, there's no fixing them. Only solution is to wipe the slate clean. Sometimes I almost feel bad for our enemies living without democracy. No say over their own lives, just believe in whatever they're told. Sad. Flag for- Womp, 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 womp. Yeah, if you can't miss that insight there, I don't know what to tell you. But here's the thing. 
Now it's even better. Nobody believes anything they're told. So I don't know. Sometimes you get your wish, right? You're like, oh, everybody believes what the government tells them. And then people are like, believe nothing the government tells you. And it's like, well, that's not a really great way to live your life either. Uh, so you can see how you would end up with basically just being like, the government will tell you things, but it literally doesn't matter if you believe them or not. Forsaken bots, they just won't accept freedom, no matter how hard we give it to them. If I were a Helldiver, I think my favorite enemy to kill would be the bots. I bet watching them spark and explode really lights up your freedom-loving heart. Hey there, Helldiver. I know you put your neck on the line for regular folks like me every day. It's not much, but I donate 15% of every one of my paychecks to the war fund. It's the least I can do. Democracy is kind of- mm, mm, mm. Love a good war fund. Um, of course, love those donations, right? Uh, every time you see a billboard about disabled American veterans, just bear in mind that uh, the government is the one who um, did that to those people, and uh, they should be the ones uh, to take care of them. Shouldn't rely on charity, right? If you're a veteran, and you put your life on the line for your country, uh, our country, the richest one in the entire world to ever exist, we can probably afford to take care of you. And if you wonder why there's a recruiting crisis, it may in part be the fact that the government will love, lovingly leave you out to dry um, if you've gotten seriously hurt or injured. Um, and again, I say this as somebody, I'm actually a defender of the VA. Um, I've had really positive experiences, but you... But the fact is that even me, who's had pretty good experiences, I still had long wait times to see like specialists, you know, um, and it's always so bureaucratic and so, so annoying. Um, and I'm lucky because like I left service doing good, went and got my master's, went back to work somewhere, right? Like I, I'm not the case study for who the VA, who needs the VA, the people that need the VA, man, they deserve so much more than they get. And the fact that they have to have their hat out and be like, please donate to the disabled American veterans, uh, that should like not have to occur. Like these machines I work on, needs regular maintenance to keep running smoothly. And the bugs are sort of like if bugs got into one of these machines, the only thing to do would be to exterminate them. When I need some motivation, I like to read that. Right, this is, okay, this is, I just want to point this out. I love they're framing these bugs as like a threat to democracy. And don't get me wrong. I suspect that if the bugs actually did take, take over in lore, there, like there would not be a democracy. Similarly, if somehow the Taliban could take over the United States, they would probably not let there be democracy, right? Um, but the real question to ask yourself is, if the Taliban were such an imminent threat to the United States that in 2002, we had to invade Afghanistan, throw them over and spend 25 years and a trillion dollars, like trying to kick them out of the country. Um, but we've lost. And now the Taliban is in charge of that country. Why? The threat hasn't changed, right? If anything, the country is more of a threat because the Taliban know the U.S. isn't going to reinvade, whereas in 2002, they were like, maybe the U.S. will invade. Like, that was a powerful stick that we don't have. So, like, do you wake up every day worried that a 9-11 is imminent? If not, then, like, maybe the Taliban being in charge wasn't that big a threat. Maybe it was never really a threat to democracy. Maybe the Taliban are just some guys that live over there in a different part of the world, and all we need our government to do is make sure that nobody tries to cross like multiple oceans to get in. And if they do, that they get arrested prior to it, which has, you know, more or less happened. There hasn't been another like spectacular attack, uh, but there have still been, right? Despite going to Afghanistan and doing all that work, uh, there's still a lot of, like, there were still a lot of Islamic terror attacks. You know, the Pulse nightclub shooting, San Bernardino, uh, uh, the Fort Hood shooter, that shoe bomber in the early 2000s, right? Like there were a bunch. And actually, now that I think about it, since 2001, there haven't actually been that many like, like Islamic based terror attacks in the United States, despite the Taliban winning, right? Wouldn't, shouldn't they have placed America in greater danger? Just some stuff to think about. The Helldiver ethos picks me right up. Sometimes I read too much and get overly motivated and kind of jittery and need to put it down. As much as I hate the bugs, I hate dissidents even more. 
They were handed freedom and chose to spit in its face. Death is too good for them. When I face... Yeah, okay. Last point. When you have... I hate the America sucks crowd. Don't get me wrong. Like, people who just knee-jerk reaction is like, America bad. Those people are idiots. Just like people whose knee-jerk reaction is, America can do no wrong. But, like, if you live in a free society and where you have a vote and free speech, you have a an obligation to criticize the government. Now, you should think through your criticisms. You should make sure that they make sense, right? And if you're a, a, a real smart guy, you should you should make sure that there's like a solution, right? But like that's your right as an American. That's like a core aspect of not just your right. It's kind of your obligation because as soon as people either punch out or they just repeat talking points, like whatever the news person says is a problem and a solution, you go, yeah, person on news is right. This is a problem, right? And once you do that, you're just, you're just a vehicle for someone else's ideology, right? So like thinking through your own problems and voting in accordance with what you actually think is best for the, for the country is absolutely your responsibility. So once you start talking about, oh, dissidents or freedom haters, listen, I'll be the first to acknowledge that if you have, there's 600 representatives-ish, 535 people who sit at the federal level and represent the United States for making laws. And so there should be about six of them that are in the 99th percentile of political extremism. And there should be 6% that are on, or six of them that are on the other side, the other 1% of political, uh, like political extremism. And like a healthy democracy should have both of those things. You know, the part you worry, you, you know, you know, you're sitting in, in, in Putin's Russia when you start to see the window of acceptable belief narrow and suddenly you go, oh, wait, there used to be like some pretty extreme sides in, in the Duma or in Congress. And now there's just like these couple of people that debate on how much they like love the military or how to, how to, you know, get more artillery shells for how to like kill more Ukrainians or whatever. Like as that world narrows, you, you just, you got to think these things out. You know, that's a sign of an unhealthy democracy. Super Earth for the vow of allegiance every morning, I can almost always feel where it is, even in a brand new part of the galaxy. Super Earth really is the best place to live in the entire galaxy, isn't it? Sometimes when I can't sleep, I imagine what it would be like to live there. You know, if it weren't for Super Earth, I couldn't even afford these high-tech tools I use every day. But they lease them out to me so I can do my job. Pretty low interest rate, too. It's fish fry night at the chow hall. I don't know what planets they get these fish from, and I don't care. It's all fried, and it's all good. I heard the chow hall got a shipment of purples in today. They're not my favorite fruit, personally, but it's nice just to have something different. Hmm, yeah. Know that feeling. Listen, when you got fresh fruit and veggies in Afghanistan, I remember that feeling. I was like, damn, an apple and a banana? You thought I won the fucking lottery, dude. I heard dissidents set another weapons factory on fire. They didn't take responsibility, of course. Tried to blame it on working conditions. Tell that to the 27 dead patriots and their families. I yeah, the irony, of course. Uh, man, remember all those shortages, like the baby bottle formula shortages and all that stuff? Uh, during during the the events I can't talk about? Yeah, I... Um, I heard those were also like caused in part by the fact that some of those factories were just like really, really unsafely run and had to get shut down and that there were only like three of them and that they would just run like they would just run as cheaply as humanly possible. I heard that some dissidents wanted us to select our own candidates instead of using the algorithm. <laughs> Great idea. Everyone will just become a political expert overnight. Treasonous morons. This is actually one of my beliefs. Uh, I actually think that... Um, like in order for a functioning democracy to work, you have to have a really good public education system. Right. And like the founding fathers, like in their own kind of like antiquate, really antiquated way, like sort of tried to understand this because they were like, Hey, listen, we can't just give everybody a vote. We need to s select people that have the experience and knowledge required to 
exercise a vote intelligently or thoughtfully, right? Not intelligently, not an intelligence test, but thoughtfully and deliberately and think things through. So they were like, okay, listen, if you, you, you got to be a guy because those are the only ones who get education. And at the, in, in, their, in the society of that time, right, like men just had more of a public interactive role. And like, they were like, and you got to own land. You got to, you got to cultivate the land. You got to literally have a physical stake in the country. Um, and they were like, that's a good proxy. And I think if you were to take that, the, the, it, it was like, they got the right idea, but it's kind of, ra- it's pretty racist and also a little sexist and also discriminatory. Right. But if you brought it into the modern era, I think you should sit there and say, listen, if you want to vote, you've got to pass a, like, <sighs> I don't know if it should be like you have to have a high school diploma or you have to pass a civic exam or 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 like something. Maybe like the the same citizenship test that immigrants have to take when they get citizenship. Maybe they should make all voters take that. It should be something. Something to say, listen, you we like the right to vote. The problem is every time we've done that in history, the assholes have gotten in charge and they've rigged the test so that the right kind of people vote, right? And usually that's code for uh, people that look like whoever's in charge. Um, but man, I just I just wish there was a way to sit there and be like, listen, you've got to be able to do just just a little bit of critical thinking about what you see, because it's true. I mean, the fact that like the dumbest person you've ever met and you have the same vote, the people that consume, I mean, you look at my comment section, guys. Most of those people can vote in their respective countries. Some of them are idiots. Not here. I mean, the gaming channel's small and better. But man, go to the Ukraine war videos, dude. You should see the smooth brain takes that these people push out. It's a trip, dude. It's actually just depresses me. Wonder which candidate will be selected for me in this upcoming election. Wonder which candidate will win the primaries. I mean, <laughs> will be selected for me. Anyway, guys, that's all I had. Please subscribe. Subscribe to the channel please subscribe to the channel. I actually may cut this out and move it to the front.